Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first ever virtual Teen Science Night. My name is Yvonne. And my name is Rhea. And we are the hosts of this event. As you're getting started and as people start to roll in, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your name, age, location, and anything else you'd like to share. Let's take a brief tour. The California Academy of Sciences is a research institute and natural history museum in San Francisco, California, that is committed to connecting people to the wonder of the natural world, the power of science, and solutions for a sustainable future. Welcome to the California Academy of Sciences, the only place in the world with an aquarium, planetarium, natural history museum, and four-story rainforest, all under one living roof. The Academy of Sciences is located in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park and is California's oldest operating museum and research institution for the natural sciences. The Academy's vision is to explore, explain, and sustain life. Every visit supports scientific research, environmental education, and sustainability innovation around the world. The Academy's green roof has several environmentally friendly features, as well as a sustainable design inspired by the seven major hills of San Francisco. The entrance is famous for the T-Rex that greets every visitor. Come and say hi to the 17 African penguins. The Morrison Planetarium is a dome with a 75-foot diameter, giving viewers an immersive experience. Inside the OSHA rainforest, a magnificent neotropical rainforest stretches 90 feet above, delighting the exploits of 1,600 plus live plants and animals, including taxicab-like sun beetles, leaf cutter ants hard at work, a slithering Amazonian tree boa, and several species of butterfly. Try to spot one. The Academy is also home to the Steinhardt Aquarium, one of the most biologically diverse aquariums on Earth. It houses nearly 40,000 live animals, representing more than 900 unique species. From the 1.5 million visitors who walk through its doors each year to the nearly 46 million scientific specimen in its collection, the Academy's impact starts right here at the museum. Teen Science Night in years past invited teens to come and relax and explore the world of science at the California Academy of Sciences. Previous Teen Science Nights were hosted in person by the Academy and offered free admission for teens. Despite the pandemic, we felt that Teen Science Night needed to go on, but of course, following CDC guidelines. We know that this is not a perfect substitute to previous Teen Science Nights, but we hope to still inspire and educate youth. This event is planned by teen interns of the Academy for teens interested in science. In light of the surge of COVID-19 and worldwide social justice movements, our team has decided to tailor this event to raise awareness about issues such as environmental intersectionality and to amplify the voices of typically underrepresented youth, especially in the world of science. This year's Teen Science Night is going to highlight what environmental justice means to Cal Academy youth and members of the audience. Along with various educational presentations, this event will also feature a digital zine about environmental justice, fun trivia about biomimicry, videos featuring submissions from audience members, short videos about environmental conservation, and two youth panels. We are streaming Teen Science Night through Zoom and YouTube. Event guests on Zoom will be able to participate in community chats, audience Q&A, and live polls. Guests on YouTube can participate in community chats. We thank you all for being here despite all of the changes in the world, and we sincerely hope that you enjoy the event. And first up is a print presentation explaining biomimicry. Make sure to pay attention as there will be trivia following this video. Hello everyone, my name is Edgar. Hi guys, my name's Elisa. Hey, I'm Viva and we are the Biomimicry Group. 
Biomimicry is when we imitate the processes and designs that we see in nature in order to solve the complex problems that we are facing. It is a new field of science that requires viewing nature through a different lens, focusing not only on what we see, but more importantly, its function and process. So an example of biomimicry would be airplanes, because airplane wings were inspired by the actual wing shapes of birds. <laughs> Biomimicry seems like a very complex topic, doesn't it? So our team compiled compiled a game to help you guys understand the concept of biomimicry in an easier way. So yeah. Players will navigate through a game learning how nature can provide solutions for the problems around us. With that being said, good luck and enjoy. All right, let's start off our trivia with a question about self-driving cars. With the creation of self-driving cars, engineers have run into a problem. How does one avoid blind spots? Which organism can engineers study to solve the problem of blind spots? Is it A, locusts, which have highly tuned neurons behind their eyes to help them navigate? B, alligator snapping turtles have a super tough shell? C, Cheetahs are very fast and great at maneuvering at high speeds. Or D, moles are very good diggers and avoid the road altogether. All right, it seems like a lot of people chose answer A. Let's see if that's correct. And that is the correct answer. A, locusts have highly trained neurons to help them navigate. Locusts have evolved to only recognize movements that will interfere with their flight path. Therefore, a locust will only recognize objects moving directly towards it rather than things moving around it. Self-driving cars are vehicles that are capable of sensing their environment and moving safely with little or no human input. But without a human's instincts, to an ability to filter out useful and necessary information, processing that much data can slow the reaction time. With locust-like programming, data inputs from sensors can be filtered faster, quicker, and more efficient. The next question is about woodpeckers. Woodpeckers have a seatbelt-like bone that runs around the entire skull and a flexible cartilage that protects the woodpecker against brain damage. What modern day product could be inspired by the woodpecker? Is it A, smoother electric sledgehammer, B, a car safety system, C, bike helmet, or D, reduce roller coaster turbulence? It appears most of you chose C, which is correct. So the answer is C, bike helmet. A flexible cartilage separates the base of the beak and skull, which protects the woodpecker against brain damage as it absorbs the shocks and helps soften repeated blows. With this understanding, a bike helmet was made. It uses a specialized cardboard that mimics the flexible cartilage and protects the skull from damage much better than other helmets. And our next question is about African termites. African termites regulate the temperature of their mounds by using heating and cooling vents. How can humans mimic this behavioral adaptation of African termites? Is it A, humans can use similar mechanisms to design temperature controlled buildings? B, we can turn on the heater when we are cold? C, humans can work together in a colony to get better at carpentry? Or D, humans can live with African termites in their houses? Let's see, oh, 87% chose humans can use similar mechanisms to design temperature controlled buildings. Let's see if that's correct. And it is, it is A. And in this picture, you'll see the Eastgate Center in Zimbabwe. 
It is the country's largest office and shopping complex, and it typifies the best of green architecture by using biomimicry principles. The building has no conventional air conditioning or heating, yet stays regulated year round with dramatically less energy consumption using design methods inspired by indigenous Zimbabwean masonry and the self-cooling mounds of African termites. This next question is about wingsuits. Wingsuits allow you to glide through the air by spreading your arms and legs. What does the wingsuit take inspiration from? Is it A, birds, B, butterflies, C, bats, or D, flying squirrels? It looks like a majority of you chose D, flying squirrels, which is correct. So the wings of flying squirrels can provide lift and decrease drag due to it being curved and having a, a well-developed foreway. This locomotion allowed humans to study the aerodynamics exciting to create a flying squirrels. Our next question is about these funny looking creatures called tardigrades. Tardigrades, commonly known as water bears, are water-dwelling microscopic invertebrates that are able to survive in the harshest climates and conditions. And they're able to do this because of their unique cells, which can withstand decades of complete dehydration. Oh, well, that was the answer, but you can, we can try. Uh, forget that you didn't see that, but how could studying water bears help researchers in the medical field? Is it A, help humans to survive longer than three days without water? B, it can help researchers understand how to extend the life of sensitive materials, such as vaccines, DNA samples, and stem cells. C, make better tasting freeze-dried foods, or D, give humans a chance at immortality. All right, I'd hope that a lot of you would have chosen B. Yep, and B is the correct answer, prolonging the expiration of sensitive materials. For example, blood stem cells have trouble surviving outside the body for long periods of time. This makes it hard to study any long-term effects. Therefore, preservation methods are a vital part of medical research. This last question is about Namib desert beetles. Water is a scarce resource in African deserts. The Namib desert beetle can survive by collecting water molecules on the bumpy surface of its wing case and raising its hind legs, guiding water droplets to its mouth. Which human problem can this beetle help solve? A, shortage of water, B, polluted water source, C, habitat loss, or D, overpopulation? It looks like 75% of you said shortage of water, which is correct. In 2019, researchers created a flexible fog harvesting structure to replicate the water collection mechanism of the Namib desert beetle. Although there have not been large scale productions of this technology, there is hope that we can switch to more sustainable options for the source of water in our new future. And special thanks to Ankush, Edgar, Zaria, Elisa, Viva and Alea for creating this wonderful presentation. Okay, thank you guys so much for playing. You guys basically learned how to, you guys learned and identified how scientists take inspiration from nature and input that into modern day technology. So how cool is that? Isn't that cool? It's very cool. Biomimicry is a different way of seeing our world, and now that we know how to use it, we can all be part of the solution for the unsolved problems that we face today. To learn more about biomimicry, you can visit the Biomimicry Institute website. Or, if you have a great idea for a biomimicry design, AskNature.org has research on thousands of nature solutions to help you. Thank you everyone for playing our game. Hopefully you learn what biomimicry is and the effect it has on human life. This has been the Biomimicry Group. Be good people and enjoy the rest of Teen Science Night.
Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Lupe. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we sent out a call for art submissions with the prompt, what does environmentalism mean to you? Uh, we received a lot of submissions in the form of poetry, video, music, and visual art, um, and created a video to feature the responses. If you didn't get a chance to submit, um, please feel free to respond to the prompt, what does environmentalism mean to you? Um, in the chat. Uh, four videos will be played throughout the event, um, but first up are our film responses. What is environmentalism and what does it mean to me? For me, it means doing my part to help keep the environment as clean and healthy as possible with my daily life and on a larger scale. In day-to-day -day life, I like to use recycled bags to reduce plastic and turn off my lights during the day to conserve energy. On a larger scale, cleaning up beaches, parks, and trails, and restoring marshlands are great ways to help more globally. As teens, it is important that we take care of the environment. Thank you so much for watching. See you later. Our world is being threatened by smog, fires, and companies that burn fossil fuels. Our hope lies in environmentalism. This is when we come together as a community to protect the natural beauties within our world in order to give future generations the opportunity to connect with the environment. We can all create change by working together and speaking up for what we believe in. Jaden and I want to talk about environmental racism and I encourage us all to research more about it. Environmental racism means that marginalized communities of usually black, indigenous, and people of color or poorer people are hurt the most by climate change because these communities historically have been forcibly moved to undesirable and polluted neighborhoods um, by redlining, by systemic racism, by gentrification, other forms of systemic racism. And San Francisco, our home, is no stranger to that. I want us to fight for environmental justice, and I want everyone to understand that climate change affects us all, but it does not affect us equally. Environmentalism to me means loving and protecting Mother Nature from the noble man-made default activities which are deploying the beauty of environment, evil activities such as plastic decomposition and pollution require to have an end in order to preserve the endless, colorful, beautiful texture of nature. All right, thank you to all the people that submitted content. There are three more videos highlighting responses that are coming up. In our next section, we'll focus on environmentalism. Now, Michael, Connie, Raya, and Matthew will teach us about environmental conservation. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael, and I'm a rising senior at Leadership High School. Hello, my name is Matthew, and I am a rising senior at Wallenberg. 
and for this segment of the event we're going to be focusing on two different conservation efforts that are situated within the Bay Area. And what conservation efforts are, are groups of people or organizations who come together to prevent the extinction of a species, whether that be a plant or an animal. And this is very important to do and very important to learn about because the extinction of any species is extremely harmful to the environment. Say for instance, a plant goes extinct, any animal that relied on that plant for habitat or for food might also go extinct due to lack of resources, and any animal that preyed on that previous animal might also go extinct due to starvation. It can also cause the overpopulation of certain species, leading to a lack of resources and a loss of habitat for other species. And for the first video we have for you today, we're going to be focusing on the San Francisco garter snake and what threats that it faces and what's already being done to help support them. The San Francisco garter snake are actually a species of common garter snake. They have a very distinctive and vivid color, such as their burnt orange head, turquoise blue body, and a very bold red and black stripe pattern. In general, they are very shy and practically harmless to humans. Their bite can be fatal to their prey, but will only cause mild irritation for humans. The San Francisco garter snake primarily eat California red leg frogs. And in nature, the predator are hawks, small mammal, and especially bullfrogs, an invasive BC that are recently introduced to California. And where can we find the San Francisco garter snake? Can we spot them in San Francisco? Despite what its name suggests, the San Francisco garter snake are actually not native to the city of San Francisco. Historically, the entire species instead reside within the 744 square mile of San Mateo County. The garter snake rely on reedy marshes, pond, and river within the county for shelter and food. The SM garter snakes have been labeled endangered since 1967. Starting with the World War II housing boom, urban development and habitat reduction have been steadily narrowing the snake's range and population to the point of endangerment. This decline in habitat has consequently pushed the California red-legged frog to endangerment as well, which reduced the San Francisco garter snake's primary food source. In addition, the resulting competition and predation from non-native species has put the snakes in a dire state. While there are many threats to the San Francisco garter snakes, it's important to not forget about the conservation efforts that are currently happening. The biggest conservation effort for the garter snakes comes from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Through their recovery plan, they have been able to increase the population, acquire habitats from urban projects, and manage groundwater and other harmful things to the snakes. All of this was not achieved alone, though, and with help from the SFO airport, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was able to create a vision of a recovery plan that would span the next 10 years for the garter snakes. While those organizations work on their recovery plans, there are a number of things that you can do in order to protect the garter snake yourself, including contacting the Fish and Wildlife Service's number when you see a garter snake in your yard or in public, keeping waste and litter out of storm drains, discouraging the purchase of exotic pets, and giving your overall support to protective regulations and conservation initiatives that are dedicated to helping the garter snakes and other animals around the Bay Area. Another species that are in danger are along our California coastline, the kelp forest. This is an image of our beautiful California coast. But did you know that the ecosystems in the water are in danger? This is an urchin barren, an area that was once filled with kelp forest and has since been taken over by urchins. Purple sea urchins are herbivores that search the ocean floor for food and have the appearance of a spiky purple ball. You may have seen these at low tide as well as in our touch tank at the Academy of Sciences. Recently, however, there has been a drastic upsurge in the purple urchin numbers, most likely due to the shrinking population of their natural predators, climate change, and their fast reproduction rate. Groups of urchins have been devastating kelp forests as they use their mouths to chew at the base of the tall kelp plants. The rapid destruction of these kelp forests, which are located primarily in shallow water, can be detrimental. Kelp forests provide homes to a wide variety of ocean organisms, including fish, mammals, and birds, and is one of the organisms that help reduce the effects of ocean acidification. Without kelp forests, many organisms will lose their shelter, waves and currents will be stronger, and CO2 levels in the ocean will rise more rapidly. Historically, sea urchin populations have been kept in check by two key predators, sea otters and sunflower sea stars. Poaching and disease have heavily impacted their respective populations, threatening sea otters and devastating sunflower sea star populations. With their predators on decline, Urchins consequently faced a sharp, unrivaled population incline. 
In order for our kelp forests to be restored to their normal and healthy state, many organizations are developing plans to ensure safe kelp growth as well as reduce the urchin population. One of the biggest steps toward kelp recovery are the kelp oasis zones, located in North Casper Bay, Noyo Harbor, and Albion Cove. The goal of these zones is to create an area with limited urchin population in order to allow the kelp to mature. Meanwhile, other groups are focused on finding ways to turn urchins into commercial item in order to encourage their fishing. Currently, they are being used as a fertilizer and with proper nutrition can be harvested for uni. While not identified as keystone species, sea urchin populations have a significant impact on predator and prey alike. Healthy sea urchin numbers bodes well for the entire kelp forest communities, including other grazers such as abalones, predators such as sea otters, the kelp forests themselves, and the fish that live among them. This healthy biodiversity affects us humans as well, since thriving kelp forests can help reduce carbon emissions. San Francisco garter snakes and kelp forests are only some of the species receiving conservation efforts. It's important to keep track of which species are endangered since many organisms help keep their ecosystems balanced and help keep them in a healthy state. If you want to learn more about these initiatives and what you can do to participate, check out our document. Those videos are so educational. Now let's take a quick break from our program to ask you, our viewers, a question. We're curious, if you could design an exhibit at the Academy, what would it be? Type your responses in the chat. And next up are more submissions to the call, what does environmentalism mean to you? This next video features art and music submissions. This one's from Mother Nature. Icebergs melting, no one's helping, please tell me how Bees are dying, am I lying, gotta change this now Wanna see children grow up, feel the sun dance in rain Instead of seeing mother nature burning down in flames Fish swim in plastic, breathing ain't fantastic Sick greenhouse gases, land of molasses I hope this passes, but we've got work to do it's getting hotter than Tim Chalamet Let's be global warming down in the face It's getting hotter than my girls and they uh. Let's make a change starting today uh. It's getting hotter than Tim Chalamet Let's be global warming down in the face It's getting hotter than my girls and they uh. Let's make a change starting today uh.
see trees of green and red roses too. I'll watch them bloom for me and you in the light of my soup. What a wonderful world. Well, I see skies of blue and I see clouds of white, the brightness of one take. Woo! Once again, thank you to all of the artists that submitted content. That was wonderful. Uh, I'd like to read out some chat responses from with the question that Raya asked earlier about what exhibit would you design? I saw quantum physics, food, frogfish fossils, sharks, invertebrates, birds, otters, and more butterflies. I agree. I really like the butterflies we have here, especially the blue morpho. Next up, we have a content block on environmental justice presented by Esmeralda and Emma. Take it away. The program will be in English and also in Spanish. Esta parte del programa será en inglés y también español. Hi, everybody, and welcome again to Teen Science Night. In this part of the program, we're going to be taking a quick look at the skin exhibit, which is located at the Cal Academy. When you first enter the skin exhibit, there's so much to see and feel, such as this rhinoceros shown. The main purpose of this exhibit is in order to show everyone the different types of skin in the animal kingdom, as well as show the racism in America due to different skin colors. While the exhibit is rich in eye-catching specimens and interactive displays, even more importantly, Gin aims to spark thought, reflection, and dialogue around the social, political, and cultural implications about race and identity. Skin also dives deeper to explore the layers of meaning humans have associated with skin color throughout history and how our ever-evolving social and political climate has influenced shifting ideas of race and culture in our modern world. Bienvenidos otra vez a Teen Science Night. En esta parte del programa exploraremos la exhibición piel que está expuesta en la Academia de Ciencias de California. Cuando primero entras la exhibición, hay muchísimas cosas que puedes ver y tocar, como este rinoceronte. En esta exposición vas a poder aprender de todas las diferentes pieles que se encuentran en el reino animal y también aprender del racismo en los Estados Unidos por personas que tienen diferentes colores de piel. Mientras la exhibición tiene muchos especimentos llamativos y exhibiciones interactivas, lo que es más importante es que Skin tiene como objetivo despertar el pensamiento, la reflexión y el diálogo de las implicaciones sociales, políticas y culturales de la raza y la identidad. Nuestra exposición explora más profundamente para explorar las capas del significado que los humanos han asociado con el color de la piel a lo largo de la historia y cómo nuestro clima social y político en constante evolución ha influido en las 
cambiantes ideas de raza y cultura en nuestro mundo moderno. Thank you so much for your time. I would like to pass it off to Emma, who's going to talk about residential segregation. Muchas gracias por su tiempo. Ahora, Emma va a hablar de la segregación residencial. Hi everyone, my name is Emma Chu and I'm an intern a part of the Careers in Science program at the Academy. And today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about residential segregation, specifically in the Bay Area. So what is residential segregation? The literal definition is the physical separation of two or more groups into different neighborhoods. This can be based off of race, class, or economic status. And this is largely due to government laws and policies such as redlining and eminent domain. Redlining is a com practice commonly used by banks to declare certain neighborhoods unfit for various services, such as loans and mortgages. Whereas eminent domain is when the government would seize private property for public use, which means they could take private housings and buildings and renovate them, making it too expensive for the original residents to move back in, ultimately leaving them homeless. And unfortunately, um, residential segregation happens everywhere, including San Francisco. So as you can see on the map, in the bottom right corner is the Bayview neighborhood, and it's the most diverse neighborhood compared to the entire city. Another, um, and with the recent impacts of climate change, the residents of the immediate coastline and low-laying areas, such as the Bayview neighborhood, will be most impacted by sea levels rising and increased flooding. Another issue the Bayview faced, specifically Hunters Point, was cleaning up the abandoned shipyard which was once originally home to the U.S. Navy's largest nuclear testing lab, but is now filled with chemicals and um, toxins, creating excess pollution, which was later declared a public health crisis. Luckily, a couple years ago, there was a class action lawsuit where residents of the Bayview neighborhood were finally able to get the city to clean up the shipyard. But unfortunately, this is only one success story out of many neighborhoods that have yet to resolve their issues. So although there has been some progress, there's still lots of effort needed to continue to further promote a clean and healthy environment for all, especially in the Bayview. Thanks so much. Let's take another quick break from our program to ask another question. We'd like to know what your favorite part of the Academy is. Please respond to the poll. Is it the aquarium, the rainforest, our planetarium shows, the living roof, our gems and minerals exhibit, African hall, the African penguins, Claude the albino alligator, the T-Rex at the entrance, or if you've never been to the academy, there's an option for that too. It's look, it looks like um, Rainforest won by a small margin, but my favorite part of the aquarium or the academy is actually the aquarium. Thank you all so much for answering. And next, Sandra and Virgil are going to showcase a zine on environmental science or racism and justice. Hello everyone, my name is Sandra and today I'll be introducing a zine that our group created called Smoke and Mirrors. Zines are basically bite-sized magazines, but they usually only focus on one specific topic. In this case, our zine focuses on environmental justice and racism in the Bay Area. Environmental racism is the corporate and or government decisions, policies, laws, or regulations that deliberately target certain communities of color in order for those in power to gain wealth. This results in communities disproportionately being impacted by environmental and public health hazards, such as toxic waste and air pollution. But luckily, environmental justice demands for all communities to be equally clean, habitable, and treated without bias. 
The environmental justice movement was started by primarily people of color who wanted to address the lack of environmental protection in their communities. And the civil rights movement of the 1960s helped vocalize and spread the knowledge of public health hazards that were occurring in other people's communities. This encouraged people to use their voices and speak up about it. And to this day, we continue to see people gather and fight against the injustices that happen in all the cities around them. And now we have Virgil, who's going to talk about the environmental justice and racism that occurs in some of our Bay Area cities, Richmond, Oakland, and Bayview Hunters Point. Thank you, Sandra. Hello, everyone. I'm Virgil and I'll be talking you through our zine, Smoke and Mirrors. Our first stop is the Chevron Richmond Refinery. In 2008, the refinery started to process dirty crude oil, which led to increased amounts of air pollution coming from the refinery, making the refinery the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in California. Ever since then, the refinery has been infamous for its history of flares and fires that have threatened the health of the residents living around the area. This refinery has existed before the city of Richmond was even founded and claims to be an essential part of the community. However, it continues to poison the community it claims to be a part of. With over 80% of residents being people of color and Richmond children having twice the rate of developing asthma than other kids nationwide, this case has moved from just being an environmental concern to an environmental justice concern. The Chevron Richmond Refinery has faced fine after fine for their copious amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, yet nothing changes. However, this doesn't mean that change can't happen. Support the fight against big oil by putting pressure on our elected leaders to phase out oil production. Sign petitions, call your representatives, and join the movement. The battle doesn't end here. Over in Oakland, the community is experiencing its own battle with environmental injustice. The Oakland Bulk and Oversized Terminal is currently being built at an old army base in West Oakland. The developers of the terminal assured the community for years that coal would not be exported through this terminal. However, in 2015, Community members learned of a secret deal between four counties in Utah to export coal through the terminal, despite the developer's assurances. Exporting coal would harm an already polluted community. West Oakland residents report higher rates of asthma-related emergency room visits, stroke, and congestive heart failure than the rest of the county. And this is all due to pollution from freeways, roadways, and truck routes. Adding coal to the mix would just make things way worse for the community. Ever since the cat came out of the bag, community members and organizations such as Youth vs. Apocalypse, Sierra Club, and No Coal in Oakland have rallied to prevent the export of coal from Oakland. The fight for a coal-free Oakland still continues to this day and you can keep that fight alive. Get involved with organizations like Youth vs. Apocalypse. Protest, sign petitions, call your representatives, make your voice heard. The battle will not rest until justice has been reached. The final section of the zine is about the Bayview Hunters Point District in San Francisco, where residents have been dealing with radioactive waste that has been left over from the former Hunters Point Naval Shipyard. Emma spoke a bit about this in her presentation before us, so we'll let you read more about it when we distribute this scene. Thank you, Virgil, for that wonderful presentation. For those who would like their own printable copy of this scene, the Academy has sent them out to everyone's email. And for those who would like to get involved and join the environmental justice movement, attached to that same email will be a list of organizations, including Sierra Club, No Coal in Oakland, and Youth vs. Apocalypse. Thanks everyone for watching. Thank you so much, Sandra and Virgil. That was very, very eye-opening. And next up are more submissions to the call, what does environmentalism mean to you? 
This final video is divided into two parts and features poetry and written submissions. The poppies cover the hillside, a super bloom seen by thousands. Many drive to them with glee, or just to see the cascading petals of orange covering the grassy green hills. I could never imagine a world without the orange poppies, the California flower, the native orange weed popping up in sidewalk cracks. A world without the poppies would be a sad one indeed. Mother Earth, I promise to protect what you have created to plant new native flowers and to learn about my state. I will reduce meat consumption and recycle as well and pick up trash. I hope this is enough to save you. Realizing that our relationship with the planet is not a symbiotic one is the first step to environmentalism. I wish for the health of the earth long past my time here. I want the future people of the planet to be able to dance across redwood forests, inhaling the sweet California air and feeling the sun seep through tree branches. I wish for them to see the ocean instead of having their cities enveloped by it. Environmentalism takes many forms. Just as each face is unique, each person gives what they can. The effects of colonization have left countries without stable governments, clean water, or alternatives to fossil fuels. It has left women without alternatives to clean water, children with only plastic toys, adults who only, whose only job option is to mine for oil. We must preserve, protect, and defend our resources the way we do our constitution. How can we sit back and preach freedom when the ground we tread on contains the blood of those who attempted to fight against systems of injustice? Environmentalism is more than a scientific movement. It is a fight to regain the heart and soul of humanity that I believe makes us remarkable. Hello, my name is Evelyn and I am from Marin County in the Bay Area. Um, I really love poetry. It's something that really speaks to my soul. And so when I saw this opportunity to write something creative, talking about climate change and talking about what environmentalism means to me, I knew I had to do it. We have the potential to change things for the better and correct you know, the things that have gone wrong in the past um, through this practice of environmentalism, which you know, it, it really means like collaborating with other people, engaging in this sort of dialogue, you know, realizing that the, the crisis of our planet and issues that we might see as distinct, like women's rights and um, poverty, world hunger, they're all so interconnected. And it's so important to realize that. And if we just work together, that's really what environmentalism is all about. Fire in his lungs, smoke in her eyes, capitalist greed covered in lies. Gray poison in my throat coats my voice struggling to float above the moat surrounding their castles. More of this, more of that, filling their bellies, making them fat, while we scurry like rats, barely getting by. The fire in his lungs becomes the fire in his eyes. The smoke in her eyes becomes the smoke out her nose. The flames of rage rise above the flames of injustice. They've awakened a war like no one will know. Sometimes I wonder of environmentalism, what it means to me. Promote the welfare, protection, restoration, and the living earth. As a group, we can take action against a harm hurting habitats. Seek to improve and advocate for the planet in addition to the ecosystem, biodiversity, and climate migration. Climate change as well, global warming causes can be preventable. I want to take care of the place that we call home for the time to come.
Once again, thank you to all of the artists that submitted content. Now let's welcome Kyle, Sarah, and Dulce, who are youth community leaders. Kyle is a local SF artist that uses his art to promote environmentalism. Sarah is a previous Academy volunteer, as well as an active member of the Youth Commission in the SF Mayor's Office, advocating for Vote 16 and environmental change. Dulce is a community organizer and environmental activist involved with Youth versus, Youth versus Apocalypse and Earth Guardians. After each panelist introduces themselves, there will be an opportunity for audience Q&A. You are welcome to submit questions into the Q&A feature on Zoom at any point, and you are welcome to ask general questions or questions specific to a panelist. Please make sure to include the panelist's name. We thank Kyle, Sarah, and Dulce for joining for ex from external programs. What's up, California Teen Science Night? My name is Kyle. I'm an 18-year-old climate activist, nature enthusiast, and artist from San Francisco. I've raised over $10,000 with my artwork for endangered species, so I'm going to share some of it with you today, and also about what environmentalism means. So to me, environmentalism means wanting and acting for equity for everybody and trying to get all of us into a safe and livable future in a just way where we can connect with as much biodiversity as possible and the same beauty that we can experience today and that our ancestors have been able to experience. So now for my artwork. Um, this is my first piece that I'm sharing and I made it in 2017. There were all these terrible wildfire headlines and we all remember the air filling with smoke and everything. And I was very scared and so I was just thinking we need, in these challenges, we need to hold tightly to what we love and motivate ourselves to protect it. My second piece is also about wildfires. Um, and this time I, I made it last year and I took a Ronald Reagan election slogan. He said, it's morning again in America. And he used to be our governor and he did a lot to polarize politics. So I was thinking, I, I said, it's morning again in California. And I was thinking, we need politics that cares about everybody, cares about the land, regardless of your party. And so that's that piece. And my final piece I'm sharing, I actually made partly during quarantine. And it is a BART train. I was thinking about how during this time we're all inside and we're all kind of in this together. And there's a natural world that's still outside that we need to continue to protect and protect everybody on this train, so to speak, and think about where we're all going and amplify our efforts. So I think that's a little bit about what this night is about, and I'm so glad to share it with you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah, and I'm a rising senior in high school, and today I'll be sharing just a little bit about the work that I've done around civic engagement and environmentalism. I hope that by sharing my work, I can help you get involved with similar work as well. So this past year, I've been serving as the vice chair and district one representative on the San Francisco Youth Commission. As a commissioner, I give recommendations to the board of supervisors and mayor's office on youth related legislation. We also advise budget priorities, pass resolutions and motions, and directly advocate for issues important to us, such as sustainability. For example, back in September, when there were youth climate strikes internationally, one of our commissioners sponsored a motion declaring the youth commission solidarity with the climate strikers, which we passed unanimously. Another example is that we've been pushing to have better public transportation so it can be more reliable for youth and reduce our city's carbon footprint. So we've spearheaded uh, the Free Muni for Youth program and also to just to have uh, more reliable service from lines many youth use to get to school, such as the 29. I'm also part of the Youth Commission Civic Engagement Committee, and we've been working on the Vote 16 campaign this past year to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in local elections. I feel like it's really important to enfranchise young people, not only to boost the voter turnout of young people, but also because 16 and 17 year olds are leading movements and are passionate about issues from climate change to racial equity. Vote 16 is going to be on the ballot this November, so right now we're pushing to get it passed. I really hope that soon we'll be able to vote for leaders who will fight for more sustainable policies and prop measures that create a more equitable and sustainable city, as those two things go hand in hand. Being civically engaged and advocating for sustainability doesn't necessarily mean you have to join a commission. You can also be engaged, for example, by creating tech solutions to issues you see in your community. 
Especially now under COVID-19, there's been a much larger reliance on technology for civic engagement, like on social media with protests being organized online and graphics with resources and calls to action. I'm currently the president of Teen Tech SF, a nonprofit dedicated to providing equal access to tech for all teens. Civic engagement is at the core of the work that we do, as our mission statement is to empower tech innovators and civic entrepreneurs. One of our main events is a civic hackathon, where any teen can think big and create innovative solutions to civic issues, and have the resources and mentors to implement that idea into a tech solution. Every year we work with city departments such as the SF Department of the Environment to create our prompts. Environmental tech solutions are one of the most popular categories and we've had teams create everything from trash collector robot prototypes to an app called Nula to help reduce users' carbon footprints. I also want to highlight our first virtual event that we had in June called COVID Connect, where we had leaders talk about using tech to become civically engaged. And the whole point of this event was to inspire participants to get involved with their communities, especially under COVID-19. I feel that tech is truly a powerful agent of social change and a really important way to become civically engaged, especially as teens. I joined Teen Tech SF after attending one of their events and I just simply asked how to join the team. It really never hurts to try and ask. And one opportunity often leads to the other. I actually learned about the Youth Commission when I presented to them for Teen Tech SF and was really inspired to apply after seeing the Commissioner's Initiative. There are so many ways to become civically engaged and advocate for sustainability or whatever you're passionate about. You could take a class to learn more, join local organizations and clubs, or you can go to protests or other events, or you can even speak at public comment to share your thoughts with elected officials. From these opportunities, you'll often find other opportunities that stem from it. You can even be part of some of the work that I'm doing. For example, you could volunteer with SF Rising's phone bank that's going on right now to push voters to support Vote 16. You could also join Teen Tech SF's leadership team, and both of those links are on the slide. Youth Commission applications are already closed, but you can intern at your supervisor's office, you can volunteer in a campaign, or you could join Youth District Councils in San Francisco. There's so many opportunities and so much need for people power. So the best way to stay updated is to follow organizations such as the Youth Commission on social media to find plenty of opportunities to get involved with activism. One of the most valuable pieces of knowledge that I've gotten is that you can't wait for hope to inspire action. Taking action is what inspires hope. I encourage you to take action, whatever form that takes on for you, and know that you absolutely have the capacity to make change in your community. Thank you so much for listening. Hey y'all, hey, my, my name is Dulce C. Arias. I am 19 years old and I live here in the Bay Area in California. And I am a youth climate justice activist and organizer. The organization that I'm part of, it's called Youth vs. Apocalypse. And Youth vs. Apocalypse is a youth-led nonprofit climate justice organization. And what we do is focus on climate change issues and we teach each other how to tackle them. And also um, we focus on uplifting our own voices of BIPOC and the young people. And how did I get involved with climate justice, activism, world, or whatever? Basically, it's a long story, but I'm gonna keep it short. And what happened was, is that I learned a little bit more about climate change and the real, like who really is responsible for climate change and natural disasters that are actually man-made most of the time. I learned all of that and like how the government and a lot of corporations keep putting profit over the lives of others, the lives of people, the lives of nature, and literally over our future. After I learned that I always wanted to do something and then I started doing like just like individual like actions that like I was trying so hard to do and I was most of the time doing it wrong. But I just like felt like I couldn't really do much, that what I was doing wasn't much. And then I found out about youth climate justice actors and like what they do. And I got inspired by um, looking at different young people that looked like me in the movement. And I said, if they could do it, I could do it too. So one thing led to another and I found Youth vs. Apocalypse. And ever since then, I took part in organizing three major youth climate strikes in San Francisco, one of them on March 15th, 
September 20th, December 6th, and also a few residency villages in Oakland, and took part in organizing different actions around California with a few other friends that are also part of an organization. And if you want to join the movement or want to like start doing some organizing or I don't know just like helping with climate justice and you don't know where to start especially because during these times you can't really go out in the crowd and well don't worry because I have a lot of things that you could join and be part of from just sitting at home and like being on your phone or your computer I'm gonna put a list of things that you could do one of them is follow our social medias and there we will have a bunch of updates of different things you can get involved with. Um, Youth vs. Apocalypse um, has campaigns or is part of campaigns. Um, one of them is Divest Callister, public school teacher pension fund who's investing $6 billion into the fossil fuel industry that's going to harm our futures. And by investing that, they said that they wanted to make more money, but actually they lost $1 billion because of their investment in fossil fuels which doesn't add up, Callisters. Um, and then we also have a campaign called Youth vs. Big Oil. And what Youth, what youth vs. Big Oil is a coalition of different youth around the whole state of California working together to tackle Big Oil. We also have Reclaim Our Power. This campaign, what we do is trying to get um, PG&E to be held accountable for the damages they have done to our communities. Um, and there's different campaigns that you could just like go to our website and find or go to our social media and find more information on. And I'll put our website here which is youthversusapocalypse.org. And for others who are from different states or different countries, well, I'm also partner with this organization called um, Earth Guardians and Earth Guardians is an organization similar to Youth vs. Apocalypse. It's youth led and it's very diverse and they have different campaigns that they're also working on that I'm part of one. And something that they have that I think is awesome is that they have crews. And what crews are is a, like a little mini chapter of the organization in your region. Um, I don't know too much about it because I'm not part of the cruise, but I know that if you go to their website, um, earthguardians.org, and go to cruise, you can find more information, and if there's a crew in your region, um, you can find how to be part of it. And the last thing um, that you could join, which I'm so excited about because I'm organizing it with a few others, it's a movement celebration Zoom party. We're going to have... A little prompt for people to like create art whether it is poetry songs rapping drawing or just like anything that lets you express your creative side and we're gonna have a DJ we're gonna have open mic it's gonna be so much fun and also we're gonna have like a ask to do afterwards and start the conversation on different issues that are going on right now that people need to like shift their attention to so um, I will put the website here where you can register. Well, thank you so much. But sorry for uh, the technical difficulties. I hope you learned a lot. But as a reminder, you're welcome to ask general questions or questions specific to the panelists. And please remember to include the panelists' name. To open up the Q&A, let's begin by having all the panelists reintroduce themselves, their names and affiliations. Afterward, we'll pull some questions from the audience. Hello, um, I guess I'll introduce myself. My name is Kyle and I am a artist and I donate um, my proceeds of my artwork to environmental causes, especially endangered species. And I also promote environmental issues with my artwork. And um, I've also helped lead environmental clubs in San Francisco for the last four years and helped join the climate movement and increase it here. And I'm super excited to be here. Hey, I'm Sarah. I'm a rising senior right now and I'm a part of the Youth Commission as well as Teen Tech SF. Um, and I'm also super excited to answer some of your questions. 
Hey y'all, my name is Dunce, I'm 19 years old, and I'm part of Euclid's Apocalypse and Earth Guardians. Great, thank you guys so much for your introductions. Um, we're going to first start off with a question for Kyle. What inspires your enthusiasm for nature and climate activism? Well, actually, uh, when it comes to like nature, what really inspires me is getting outside. So there's a lot of parks in the Bay Area and especially exploring it with my friends and um, just having like outdoor activities that really helps me realize like the communities and the places that I want to protect. And that helps inspire my work, gets me thinking about like what I want to include and what I want to draw and also the kind of people who I think that these places should be protected for because I really hope that in a hundred years, um, San Franciscans will be able to see the same beauty and also Bay Area people and you know the entire um, country and world that our future generations can appreciate the beauty and the biodiversity that is out there in even greater ways than today and I really believe we can make that better future and so I kind of imagine those things in my artwork. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, it's crazy to think about how many of us share the same route for our inspiration. I hope that we can enjoy that future together. Well, our next question is for Sarah. Why is it important to get involved in civic engagement as a team? Yeah, I think that it's super important to get started at a young age just because like so many issues right now do affect us, especially like local issues, anything from like sustainability, housing, public transportation, education, etc. There's just like an endless array of issues that do affect us. Um, so it's really important for us to exercise like our our voices and to make sure that our democracy is representing our voices. Um, so I feel like that's also an important inspiration behind why I wanted to take on Vote 16 to make sure that 16 and 17 year olds are able to vote and be civically engaged in that way. I mean, we already see with like under the Black Lives Matter movement, we saw 16 and 17 year olds organizing the Mission High School protest and the Golden Gate Bridge protest. So we can see that, you know, 16 and 17 year olds and youth in general are very passionate about issues, um, political issues, especially during these times. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's really important that people, our voices are represented and that we um, can vote also because yeah, hopefully vote 16 will allow us to have a voice in our democracy, but also outside of that, you can still do, um, you can still exercise your voice in many other ways like protesting and speaking public comment and some of the things that I'd mentioned in my presentation. Thank you so much, Sarah. I agree. Uh, a lot of people my age, yeah, we're out here protesting, organizing, spreading the message. And I think it's really, really important for us to get our voice in the democracy. Thank you so much. Next is a question for Dulce. Um, when planning a protest, what are, are there any special things to keep in consideration, like communication, food, road closures, things like that? Yeah, when planning the protest, I think it's important, first of all, to have a team, um, to have a target, and to have demands. Um, when you have a team, it makes it easier for you because not all the work is going to be falling on your shoulders. Um, you guys could divide any like little job um, that has to be done, whether making flyers, printing them, canvassing, um, asking the city for permission to have a like major gathering. Um, and also like um, think about like the streets where you're going to go. Um, is it going to make traffic? Um, who are the people that are not going to be able to um, pass through there? And also think about like how long your march or your strike is going to be because um, there's um, folks who are disabled, um, there's younger kids, there the elderly who may not be able to walk a lot in the sun, so make sure that there's water, um, there's the, that there's volunteers passing out water and food and any like type of resources that the strikers might need. Um, and for the demands, make your demands clear. Um, and I forgot to say this before, but make sure that the people leading the march and the people leading the movement is those that are most affected by whatever issue you're trying to fight. Thank you. Yeah, that was really insightful. I feel like a lot of people think that planning a protest is way out of their league and that it's a lot to handle, but with a group, like you said, it's definitely feasible. 
All right, uh, our next question is for Kyle. A lot of people in the audience want to know what medium you use for your artwork uh, and how long it takes each piece to finish. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, thank you everyone for, for asking that and for liking the artwork. Um, my pieces generally tend to be watercolor because there's a couple of reasons for that, but one of them is because I really feel like I'm working with nature when I'm working with watercolor. Um, like you're just, you're much more in tune with like the, um, like the paper and the colors and everything. And also like painting with oil paint and having the whole like fossil fuel movement doesn't really feel right. And so that's why I like watercolor. Um, and then I also like digital artwork because as we see during coronavirus, like being digital and, you know, we're all connecting digitally here. It's a really important medium. And I think that there's all sorts of opportunities for people to engage digitally. So I like making digital artwork um, and then putting that like out online. That's a good way. Um, yeah, watercolor and digital are probably my main mediums. Thank you so much, Kyle. I never really thought about how conflicting that would be to like have oil paintings. That's really interesting. All right. Um, next, we have a question for Sarah. What's one of the most rewarding benefits to working in your community? I think the most rewarding thing is just like, I've grown up here all my life here in San Francisco, here in District 1. Um, I am specifically like the District 1 Youth Commissioner. So, you know, I feel like I've, I have a lot of experience with seeing, you know, what's wrong in my neighborhood or just like things I would like to improve on or things that I want to give a voice to. Um, so I'm really glad that through my role, like I feel really privileged that I'm able to shed light on some of these issues and make San Francisco, but also District 1, just like a better place for youth like me, just because I do have first exper firsthand experience with that. So it's really rewarding to be able to talk to people also um, outside of the City Hall. I feel like, you know, with our meetings in City Hall, it can be a bit isolating from the community, but it's really nice during community events, especially pre-COVID-19, to get to talk to these people and be really appreciative of like the work that we're doing. So yeah, I just, I, I'm, I think the most rewarding part is just seeing how we're able to uplift these voices that are usually not represented in City Hall. Yeah, thank you so much. I feel like a lot of teens and people in general, part of the community, forget that they can be involved with change, especially things involving like the government. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have another audience question. Um, this one's for Dulce. What's one of the biggest things you've learned from being an activist and meeting other people who also care about environmental justice? And she says, P.S. I love your hair. Oh, thank you for that. Um, and I feel like one of the things that I've learned um, by meeting new people and working with others is basically like how unity is so important and so powerful. Um, different people coming together for a common goal and working on it and like it does like change happens and another thing is also like you know climate change could be so scary um and like everything that's going on right now um it's so scary and like it's easy to lose hope but um by meeting people and knowing that they're also going through similar things um and knowing how everybody's like dedicated to the movement like i regain hope all over again and it just reminds me that i'm not alone Thank you so much. Uh, I like how you said that you've regained hope because uh, I'm imagining that a lot of people in the audience are regaining hope from your message. And I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Here's another question for Kyle. What software devices slash programs do you use for your digital art? My favorite uh, software device is probably Procreate on the iPad. Um, it just is like really easy to draw. And you don't even need to have like any like extra tools. You can just like kind of use your finger and draw with that. So it takes me back to like kind of the original art forms where people just use their hands, but in like a digital context, which I think is kind of interesting. And I like using that. And also like you can create all sorts of formats and file types. So it makes it easy to apply that to like for websites or for Instagram posts or anything necessary. It's great to hear about the application of digital art. Thank you so much. We have another audience question, this time for Sarah. Oh, sorry, let me try to find it. Let's 
Uh, do you think that lowering the voting age to 16 would encourage that age group to vote? Because here in New Zealand, the lowest group of voters is in the 18 to 24 age category. Yeah, for sure. Um, first off, thanks for tuning in from New Zealand. That's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think that lowering the voting age to 16 will get more young people involved. Um, we see this with, there's already 19 countries that have expanded voter right, voting rights to 16 and 17 year olds, and also three cities here in the US, all in Maryland. And we see in one of those cities, Tacoma Park, actually um, within these like past few years, um, there's a much, there's double the turnout uh, from 16 and 17 year olds in the general electorate. So we already see that 16 and 17 year olds, when they're given the right to vote, they will vote. Um, and also 16 is a much more like accessible age to begin registering to vote. Um, when you're 18, you're in a time transition going off to college. So voter registration can be really hard and also really hard to navigate because of strict voter ID laws and whatnot. Um, so it makes sense to expand voting rights to 16 and 17 year olds, years old because that's also when we're learning like US history um, in school, and that makes it a great time to also introduce um, voter registration education at the same time. Um, so yeah, I think that absolutely lowering the voting age to 16 and 17 will get more young people involved in democracy. And especially that's such a big or uh, like a really important solution because like the, vo the voter turnout of 18 to 29 year olds here in the US is really low. So we definitely want to make sure that you know, we get that uh, voter turnout as high as possible. Thank you, Sarah. I definitely agree with you. Um, since like 17, 16, 17 year olds are doing so much in the world right now, I definitely feel like we deserve a voice. We deserve a vote. And I appreciate you for all the work that you've committed. We have another audience question. This is for any of you. Um, how did you guys get involved in volunteering specifically? How did they get in, how did you guys get into your current roles? Um, any of you guys can answer in the respective order of like Dulce, Kyle, or Sarah. Um, I guess I could go. Um, well, I got involved by um, literally just Googling. Um, I Googled climate justice organizations in the Bay Area. Um, and it led me to Youth Business Apocalypse. And my initial goal was like helping like the youth activists like achieve whatever they, they were gonna do. And that kind of like sorta made me an activist. Um, and my first role was just like something that needed to be done. And it was like creating like digital flyers for an event that was gonna happen. Um, and then like I started like different things that I like started doing different things that needed to be done and just like volunteering um, for the different jobs. Um, but now what I am, I'm a com campaign lead and I'm also in the lead circle of Youth Versus Apocalypse. In the lead circle, we just make um, like different decisions. We are able to like change the structure of the um, Youth Versus Apocalypse organization. Um, and just we come up with, with ideas to get like more youth involved and stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, all of my opportunities were found by my father, but it's nice to know that just doing something as simple as looking it up can help you find ways to get involved. Yeah, I can answer too. Um, for me, I got started with like sort of activism was through Teen Tech SF and that was actually just through like going to one of their events. Um, my sister was going and she's just like, you should just come along and see what it's about. I was like, you know what, why not? Sure. So I feel like, you know, so much of the start to like volunteering and activism just starts with like an interest or like a passion in a certain thing and it'll really just like grow from there. Like as long as you have that passion and you're constantly seeking opportunities to connect with the community or connect with different organizations, like that, that growth is going to happen naturally. So yeah, I went to the event and it was a super informative and um, interesting event to me. And I was like, that was something that was, I wanted to help out with. So I just, I just asked one of like the student leaders, like, is there any room to apply or to join? And they're like, yes, like totally just come to our next meeting. And like, we'd, happy, we'd be happy to like get you involved. Um, so yeah, I feel like there's so much room for opportunities 
there's so much need for like volunteers out there also. So just like reaching out to those opportunities, I think will um, will do a lot for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once again, like inspiration and just willing to put yourself out there and advocate for yourself and your, what you're proud of or what you're into. That's really cool to see. Yeah, I agree with what's been said. And um, just like the, this is a whole movement and there's so many places for all sorts of people and interests and passions and talents in the movement. So people can really go anywhere with it. And if you have something you're passionate about, there is a place in this environmental movement, if you want to call it that, for you. Um, but, there, you know, it's larger than environmental. There's so much world change we're trying to make. And personally, for me, I got started because I was just, like, wanted to raise money for endangered animals because I, like, read a book about all the animals that were kind of dying out. So I would, I started a bake sale and then would kind of, like, you know, that classic lemonade stand. And eventually people, like, liked the artwork that I was making on the posters for the bake sale. So I was like, oh, I'll start doing artwork. And it kind of led to more opportunities and ways for me to um, get a message out there and also raise money for the animals that I really care about. Yeah, tying back to Sarah, what you said about having the inspiration and just getting the ball rolling with your art, the same thing. Yeah, very cool. Thank you guys so much for your answers. We have another audience question. And this one is, how do you use intersectionality as activists to bring more people together from different backgrounds to support environmentalism? Uh, we could go in uh, reverse order. Okay. Um, so I started an environmental club at my high school, so that's probably where intersectionality most comes in. And the best thing that I found is reaching out to groups, because there's so many organizations, whether you're on a campus or in the community, um, and there's so many organizations that have their groups. And sometimes groups can attract different types of people. And if you want to create intersectionality, then you have to bring the groups together. And the best way to do that is to realize your common goals and look at like, oh, we're both trying to change the world. Let's support each other's efforts. And then you can reach out to the group leaders and be like, hey, let's work together on this project. And it really brings all sorts of people together for a common cause and you can support each other's endeavors. I agree. Clubs are really, really important for organizing everyone together towards a common goal. And I really appreciate the club that you've founded. Yeah, just adding on to Kyle's answer, I absolutely agree. It's just like all about outreach and like forming those connections. So like in the Youth Commission specifically, like we have a network of all these different like community-based organizations or CBOs that we work with in San Francisco. And like during our meetings, they can come present and whatnot and just talk about like the work that they're doing, whether that be like sustainability or racial equity or, you know, whatever it is. And much of those issues are intersectional, like you mentioned. Um, so yeah, it's super cool to just like reach out to those um, organizations also um, to look for like interested applicants and make sure that we are, uh, the Youth Commission is representing like a diverse body and that uh, we represent a diverse um, range of needs as well. Thank you. I really, I agree. Um, reaching out to organizations will definitely help uh, make our voices larger and will help people realize that we're serious about this. Yeah, um, for me, for Youth Versus Apocalypse, we have a thing called a fellowship. Um, in this, we just like um, reach out to people in schools that have environmental clubs and stuff like that, um, and try to get the youth together so that we can like educate ourselves and teach us about organizing and climate change, the intersectionalities that come along with it. And I think that's a really like good way to like get um, other youth involved um, because like sometimes, like a lot of the times it could be intimidating when you see like youth organizers or activists because they just like know a lot of things and they're like super smart. And like, I don't know, like before that was me, like I didn't feel like I could make a change because I thought like I wasn't as smart as they were. But um, joining a fellowship or like joining an organization, we basically teach each other, like you might not know one thing last week, but this week you know it and you could talk about it. Um, so that that's a good thing to um, get other people involved. And my favorite thing to get people involved that normally wouldn't is art. 
um, because some people wouldn't like read um, a 20 minute um, document or an article, but some people are going to be able to listen to a five minute song or two minute song or like look at a painting and say, oh, because a painting and like photos like have a lot of words in it without actually being there. Um, I don't know. And I think that's like a good way to also get um, people that normally wouldn't um, get involved into the movement. Thank you so much, Dulce. Uh, I liked how you pointed out that um, organizing in these groups really helps advance our knowledge and the movement. Like teaching each other is so, so, so important and just establishing a community. And also really like they pointed out art because like art really is, um, it's intersectional and it's universal and everyone can see it and respond to it and really, really enjoy it. And I'm glad that you pointed that out. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, last question. Do you, any of you panelists have any organizations that you would like to promote or any events, as well as any advice that you'd like to give to other teams? This can go in the order from, from Kyle, Sarah to Dulce. All right, I have one event I would like to promote. It is the uh, Bay Area um, Youth Climate Summit, and you can get involved at BAY cs.org that's b-a-y-c-s.org it's a climate summit that is happening on the 12th of september i believe and there's all sorts of resources on the website and instagram and stuff you can like get involved in like that so once again that's b-a-y-c-s.org and um as for advice i just like think you know coming from an event like this and i really appreciate everybody who's watching um just like after this you know start doing your own like research and involvement and you can really take off and who knows you'll You'll be on this panel next year. <laughs> yeah, for me, uh, first off, yes, definitely go to the Climate Summit. I saw it on Instagram. Uh, seems like a super cool opportunity, so I encourage everyone to check that out. Um, and for me, I already mentioned some of those opportunities in my presentation, so I'll just like reiterate them. One is, um, you know, if you really support Vote 16 and um, expanding voting rights to 16 and 17 year olds here in San Francisco, we definitely need volunteers for our phone bank. Um, so SF Rising is hosting a phone bank right now to reach out to voters um, to support Vote 16 and also Schools and Communities First, which is a statewide prop which will reinvest $13 billion into schools and communities. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering, um, please sign up. I'll put the link um, in the chat after my answer. Um, but yeah, we definitely need as many volunteers as possible. It's super flexible. You could just drop in whenever and you don't need any experience. So like we'll onboard you. And then also for Teen Tech SF, um, it would be great if you want to join. I also dropped that link in the chat later on. Um, but it's not really like an application process. It's just like an interest form because we just need volunteers to join. So it's not selective. Please join if you want to. And yeah, just stay updated on uh, our social medias as well, uh, Teen Tech SF and also San Francisco Youth Commission. Um, for me, um, I would suggest joining the Youth Versus Apocalypse campaign um, and just go to our, to our website or our social medias. On our social medias, we put the times where we will meet. Um, what, and you could join a campaign if you want to buy big oil, if you want to do work around the Green New Deal, or get calisters to defund defund the six billion dollars we're investing into fossil fuels um and another thing on august 16th um around 5 p.m pacific time there will be a zoom party kind of like this one but we will have mostly music um and there will be a prompt given um where we together could create like art or poetry or anything like that um, and the website, you will find it if you go to earthguardians.org um, so that you can register and we can send you the Zoom link. Okay, thank you guys. Once again, thank you all so much to all the panelists. Uh, make sure to check their organizations out. Thank you for your participation and thoughtful answers. And next up is our final poetry submission video. Enjoy. To me, 
Environmentalism is the protection of the planet that we call home. It is showing respect to the planet and the things that it provides for us, like the different plants and animals that roam with us. Environmentalism is fighting against the pollutants that are so commonly used in factories that billow smoke into the air like cigarettes for the earth, slowly killing it. I think environmentalism gives you the opportunity to reconnect with the outside, whether through planting your own foods or through hiking on trails and listening to nature. It gives us the chance to give back to the earth that has provided us with sustenance. Environmentalism is taking care of yourself as well by eating healthier foods that you may grow in your backyard or taking time to get outside, even if for just a short walk and getting some fresh air. Environmentalism shouldn't be seen as a problem. It should be seen as something that helps rather than harms, something that provides rather than takes, like the earth does for us. Excuse me, why is environmentalism defined as a fight? First off, it's not a fight. It's the fight to save Earth from burning by the age transcending fires of humanity's hands to restore and protect the homelands we conquered from the animal kingdom before the timer hits zero, or a fiery destructive future becomes the irreversible price we pay for our, our inaction. Confused? Let me explain. We're paying the price for ignoring Earth's cries when it developed a high fever, sick from consuming our fossil fuel leftovers. With the fever reaching a point beyond curable, I fight to save our planet from a burning, blazing, dirty tomb and lead it into a cleaner, greener, renewable tomorrow. Why the animal kingdom though? In our drive to industrialize, we conquered the wild, destroyed their homes, creating an ongoing road to extinction, a road paved by deforestation, fossil fuel drilling, poor land management, and more. I fight to preserve what hasn't been bulldozed restore the land that was lost, and design a future where we live alongside nature and not turn it into barren, lifeless wastelands. This is the fight defined as environmentalism. My mother was born in a river. The womb from which she came lined with coke cans and cigarette butts. My mother rose from a polluted garden, sewed flowers between her ribs, and bandaged broken butterflies at her banks. My mother's eyes shine brighter than any sun. They rival the golden chariot which brings daylight to her feet each morning. My mother's fruit is sweet. She feeds her children all that she bears, but her limbs have grown frail. My mother is wise. Her acuity matches Minerva, but her voice grows weak. Sacrifice is not unfamiliar to her. She has not known a life without pain. A woman has birthed in Eden, but her leaves are burning. Her children will no longer shout her name. Hi, my name is Kira, and to me, environmentalism is so important because it looks to conserve and save important aspects of our ecosystem, such as our diverse reefs, rainforests, and beautiful Arctic Circle. As a society, we progressively continue to harm and destroy our Earth and nature, but environmentalism is what we do to work together and fight against the damage we've done, and to prevent further harm in the future that can be shown through beach cleanups, conservation efforts, animal rehabilitation, and living sustainably. All right, before we transition into our final part of the event, we're curious, what's been your favorite part of Teen Science Night? Has it been art, guest speakers, or something you've learned? Respond in the community chat. And for our final event of the day, we are going to have a panel with the teams that helped plan Teen Science Night. Welcome, Matthew, Virgil, Lupe, and Connie. Feel free to leave questions in the Q&A box. While we wait for them to become settled in, I'm just gonna read some of the responses. A lot of you really liked the art and guest speakers as well as the trivia. So a lot of the activities, which is really nice to hear. And I really enjoyed all of them as well.
Hello, everyone. Uh, would you please introduce yourself and your role in Team Science Night? Um, hi, guys. Um, my name is Lupe. Um, I am a member of the Team Science Night team, but more specifically, I was part of the team that sent out the call for any art submissions. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Connie, and I'm a team member of the Team Science Night planning team. And I'm also a part of the conservation group that created the San Francisco Guard of Snake conservation video that you saw earlier. Hi everyone, I'm Matthew and I'm also a part of the TSN team. I worked on this Q&A section and on the kelp on the kelp forest section of the conservation video. Hi, um, I'm Virgil. And unlike all the other panelists, I did not work on Teen Science Night directly. But I did lead the development of the zine I talked about earlier, smoked in smoke and mirrors. Thank you all so much for your introduction. So first up, we have a question for Lupe. Were you planning for an online event from the start? If not, how did you handle the transition? Um, wow, okay. So initially we were not planning an online event. We had been planning um, for a few months now a live physical event, but when everything started, we had no choice but to start from scratch. Um, I'm, sh I'm very, very sure that most of our team freaked out uh, due to the unexpected uh, change, but together we discussed and brainstormed to move forward and keep Team Science Night going. Yeah, for sure. Um, planning an online event for the first time must have been really, really hard. Thank you. And our next question is for Connie and Matthew. After planning this event, what did you learn or take away from it? And what are you proud of? Um, for me, um, I think one valuable thing that I learned from planning this event is like how to work productively as a team. So for example, I learned how to communicate more efficiently with my teammate. And I also learned how to be more professional. And of course, I'm really proud of everyone's hard work and especially every single person in my team because I'm really seeing how much we grow and learn from the experience. Thank you, Connie. Uh, thank you so much for doing so, so much for Team Science tonight. Uh, one thing that I learned was how weeks of effort get put into only a couple hours of presentation and video and how much research and editing goes into just a couple of minutes of video, like the Cup Forest and the Carter Snake video that the viewers don't get to see. That's true. I bet there's a lot of extra content that a lot of people would like to see. Maybe we'll share it with someday. Another question, this is for Lupe and Connie. What was the most challenging part of planning this event? Um, I could go first. So the fact that this event was going to be virtually was difficult. Um, as I did mention earlier, we did have to start from the beginning again. Um, but I also feel like technology was a huge issue along with marketing and receiving any form of art submissions. Um, and for me, I absolutely agree with Lupe. So like seeing this is everyone's first time planning in an online event like this, it's absolutely like difficult for all of us here is because we don't have any experience before. And then other than that, we also had to make like a lot of decisions about what, how we should organize the event virtually and what content we should include to like make the event fun and engaging to you all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really important to remember the differences between an in-person versus a virtual event, especially when it's something like this that's kind of has a lot of work that goes into it. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Virgil. A lot of this event was focused on environmental justice. How did you decide on that topic? Uh, well, for me, um, I was inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I just wanted to figure out a way that I could uh, combine current events with my work in careers in science. So I thought that uh, focusing on environmental racism and justice would be the perfect fusion of both. Uh, a lot of people think that environmentalism and racism don't have anything to do with each other, but these topics are actually 
intertwined and intersectional and multifaceted. And I just wanted to bring light to that with this project. Thank you so much, Virgil. Uh, I'm glad that you use this platform to speak about issues that are very prevalent and issues that um, you're so passionate about. You're really, really right when you're talking about how a lot of people don't think that these things, these issues are connected. The, they all are, and it's really a fight for all of them. Okay, next question is for Matthew. So we're seeing that during a lot of the videos about your the wildlife conservation, there was a lot of professional conservation efforts. Are there any programs or volunteer youth or volunteer programs that youth can help with? Yeah, uh, we compiled a bunch of ways that youth can contribute to conservation efforts. Uh, some of them being like uh, cooking meals more uh, with more sustainable. Um, animals like um, like salmon or participating in events such as a beach cleanup. Uh, af after the event, we'll be emailing the documents with information on ways to get involved with these. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question for Virgil and Connie. Did you know a lot about these environmental justice topics prior to the event? Uh, for me, I had like vague knowledge about the environmental justice cases discussed in the zine. Uh, I knew that they were happening, but I didn't really know the history or details of these cases. Uh, I began to do further research once the project started and it was just mind boggling that these injustices were happening so close to home. Uh, but I'm glad to be a more educated person from it and hopefully the educates the zine educates uh, many of you guys as well. And for me, I knew some of the of the topic prior to the events, like from school or from the news, but I didn't like really go deep into these topic. So re doing some research for this event is definitely a good opportunity for me to educate myself and learn more about the environmental justice. I'm glad that you took this opportunity to educate yourself and I'm glad that it expanded your knowledge. Great, we have, next question we have is for anyone here. Why did you guys desi decide to make a virtual event? This can go from Connie, Lupe, and then to Matthew. Um, we decided to make a virtual event because we feel like we should, we should continue to do Team Sign Night this year, despite the current situation. And we also have to um, create a way that everyone can still enjoy the event while, while like staying safe at home. So we do a virtual event. Great, thank you. Anyone else? No, all right. Um, yeah, it's great to know that you got, we were still planning on hosting an event, whether it be virtual or in person, despite Corona happening. Thank you. Yeah, like Rhea said, and like we said in the beginning, we really thought that this event would be important to like, spread the word and bring light to topics that aren't really talked about. Uh, and a question for Virgil, how long did it take to make the zine and where did you find the images? Uh, the zine, so it was a project that started in like around mid-June, I'd say. Um, the team that I worked with, we met up uh, once a week for about two hours. Um, and we were, it was kind of like split up. We were, I'd, I had a, like a, an art team that kind of did the visuals for it. Um, I was in that team, I, I made the cover. And then you'll also see some other pieces that um, members did in that as well. And then there was another team, the writing team, they wrote all the uh, different articles, um, uh, basically um, like explaining the context of the different environmental justice cases in the Bay Area. And then, um, yeah, so it, it's like, it's just a bunch of like, uh, like awesome writing and awesome art from uh, everyone who worked on it. Um, so, and there are a few images in there that uh, was not produced by the team. Um, those images are just some pictures I found um, 
on like Flickr that are like Creative Commons. Um, so I didn't have to deal with any like copyright laws or anything. Um, and they, uh, there's just like uh, related to the different uh, locations mentioned in the zine. So yeah. Thank you. And thank you for spending so much time investing a lot of work into this. It really looks amazing. So we have a question for Lupe. Are you an activist? If so, what is your favorite part? And she also said she likes your earrings. Thank you. <laughs> um, I actually got them from Mexico. But activist, I am not an activist, but I do support um, environmentalism and I do support like with helping the earth be more green. Um, I am not in the campaign like Dulce is, but I do support the earth. Um, yeah, I just hope the earth reduces much more in plastic as well, um, as well with their carbon emission. Great, thank you. Yeah, you don't have to be um, a proclaimed activist to make any change. You can make small changes in your own day-to-day -day life and still the same thing. All right, uh, we have a general question from the audience. Uh, anyone can answer this. How much should this event change since finding out it would be virtual rather than in person? Uh, Virgil, would you like to answer? Uh, yeah, um, I guess. How much did the event change? Is that, could you, sorry, could you repeat the question a little bit? Yeah, of course. How much should this event change since finding out it would be virtual rather than in person? Oh, um, I guess it changed a ton. Um, I mean, okay, so last year I was on the planning committee for Teen Science Night, um, which was in person due to Corona not being a thing, obviously. Um, and I guess, um, it, it must have been a very different uh, way of planning. Um, I, I wasn't personally involved in the planning of Teen Science Night this year, but um, I've never, I guess, I've never like really organized a, a digital event. Um, so I guess like the different features uh, of the event must have changed a ton, I guess. I don't, I don't, I might, yeah. I, that's my answer. Yeah, that's really true. It's, it's very hard to uh, explain what could have been, but uh, I'm glad that we, we've adapted to the situation, that we were able to provide this event virtually. Okay, um, next we have another general question. This one's a little bit more, you know, normal, I guess. <laughs> um, what animal that is endangered would you choose to save? Um, we can go from Matthew, Connie, Lupe, and then Virgil. Um, I would definitely save sea otters because they're keystone species for kelp forest um, ecosystems and they're just adorable. And for me, I would definitely save the sea turtle because I was doing some research and I actually saw like some of the species are in like critically endangered and they are adorable. So I really want to save them. Um, I would say the Sumatran elephant because elephants are the best animals on this whole planet. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, I'd say, I'm actually not sure if they're endangered, but they sound like they might be. Um, nudibranchs? Nudibranchs actually are like a whole like family of species, um, but they're very cool. Um, for those of you who may not know what nudibranchs are, they're basically, uh, I think their common name is like sea slugs. Um, they're very pretty. They live in coral reefs and I think they're awesome so yeah yeah there's a lot of endangered animals that need saving so it's nice to hear some specific ones thank you all right 
this will be our uh, final question, or one of our final questions. Uh, what advice would you give to other teams interested in hosting a digital event? Uh, for me, I would say that you should get familiar with a bunch of digital programs. Uh, in my case, I've had to use programs like uh, Adobe InDesign and Autodesk Sketchbook Pro, which is this like drawing software um, to make the zine. And I've also used Google Hangouts and Zoom to uh, meet up with all my team members. And there's also like a bunch of free tutorials on YouTube that show you how to use these programs. I mean, I mean, I knew nothing about InDesign before starting this project. Project, um, but I learned from YouTube. I watched a bunch of like all these different tutorials showing me how uh, all the different tools worked, and um, it was really helpful. And that's kind of how I learned how to use it. And there's also just like a bunch of like free alternative programs to expensive ones like InDesign that work just as well. So you don't really have to dish out a ton of money to produce quality results. Um, I would agree with Virgil about getting familiarized with different digital programs. Um, but I would also have to say that if you plan on hosting an online event anytime soon, you must have the determination to get it done. Uh, and definitely gather a small group of people to help and keep the motivation up and going. That's really, really true. Thank you so much for your dedication. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that the audience really, really appreciates it. Uh, we have one of our final questions. Do Does anyone on the panel actually think that we can recover from climate change? This is a big one. I, I can take this. Or actually, Lupe, did you want to talk about this? I'll give it to you. Sorry. <laughs> um, but I, I think we can. Um, like, it's a really, really small possibility. But I feel, I feel like if we'd all put um, our minds to it and we all work together to like get through the situation, I think we can. Thank you so much. Virgil, did you want to answer now? Yeah. Um, the thing with climate change is that like we're already seeing the consequences of um, the excess amount of uh, greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Um, just like stronger um, weather, like hurricanes and a bunch of like drought and floods in different areas. Um, the thing with like being located in the United States is that um, a lot of the times you don't really see those effects. Uh, you don't really, we're like, I guess residents of the United States are kind of shielded to those things while other people in the world are experiencing it head on. Um, the thing um, I would say is that it, it is possible to slow down these effects. Um, we just have to act now, you know, like um, switching to uh, cleaner energy, um, holding corporations that dump all of these um, greenhouse gases into our atmosphere accountable, um, especially as a big one. Um, a lot of people think that um, switching to like metal straws or reducing your uh, own like meat intake um, is like the fault or actually like eating meat and using plastic straws or single use plastics is the fault of climate change. And yes, that is a factor that contributes to um, this problem, but corporations that dump a bunch of greenhouse gases into atmosphere and pollute environments and destroy habitats are the bigger culprits here. It is important that we try our best as individuals to um, limit our use of single-use plastics or uh, try to live a greener life, but we really should be um, looking at the bigger corporations in play. Yeah, that's really um, true. Yeah. It's nice to know that you guys have some like sense of faith in us that we can get past this. But like you said, it is the big corporations that are really affecting us. And even doing the small things might not fix it. We really do have to 
think like big picture. Thank you so much to our panelists, Virgil, Matthew, Connie, and Lupe for your participation and thoughtful answers. And that wraps up the event. If you're looking for more content from the California Academy of Sciences, check out our YouTube channel for information about the work that we do at the Academy. Thank you all so much for attending Teen Science Night 2020. Please check your inbox for an email providing resources as well as a survey to let us know your thoughts on the event. Thank you and good night. Bye.